Hey, welcome everybody. We've got John Danner here, here today, and we're going to be uh, discussing a somewhat controversial subject, robot sex. Um, and John Danaher is a lecturer at the uh, National University of Ireland and has been involved in writing all sorts of um, awesome uh, publications, often uh, at IWET. I think you're an affiliate scholar or something like that there. Um, yeah, I'm still an affiliate scholar there, yeah. Yeah, and uh, yes, yeah, has, has uh, contributed quite a lot there. Uh, also, uh, on the topic of algocracy, um, and previously, uh, which I did an interview with you about earlier, and also you covered off quite a bit of um, uh, a pretty strong review of Nick Boston's superintelligence, one of the earlier ones uh, before it got really popular. Um, okay, well, yeah, we're here to talk about uh, uh, robot sex. Uh, what? what possess you to write a book, book about that there, John? Yeah, so I think it's originally um, James Hughes's fault from the okay. IWT. Yeah. So I, a couple of years ago, the uh, the journal that the IWT uh, publish, um, what's it called again? The Evolution, uh, Journal of Evolution and Technology. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the Jet, Jet Press. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's so right. They, did a, they did a special edition on technological unemployment and the basic income guarantee. Mm. And James asked me if I would have been interested in writing a paper for that. And oh, okay. I wasn't really sure if I would be interested in it, but I happened to be teaching a class at the time about uh, the regulation of sex work and the status of sex work and the economics of sex work. Mm. And I thought it would be interesting to explore that looking at the technological unemployment angle. So right. would would sex workers be subject to the same kind of displacement by technology as, you know, car manufacturers? Right. So that was the that was my initial initial gateway into the into the topic. Right. And, and from there, I kind of realized that there were some interesting ethical and social questions to be asked about the rise of robot sex and, you know, technology and sexuality have always developed hand in hand, mm. so to speak. Um, so, I thought there were there were topics that were worth exploring and that were under explored or underserviced by the academic community. And a lot of this was debated by either purveyors of the technology or by in popular media, and that it would be worth having a, a slightly more serious and sober academic look at the topic. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, so, well, I. Uh, okay, so this book is—is is it being um, uh, incorporated into a larger journal, or is it just a standalone book? Yes, it's that's a book that's be... published. It's a book published by the MIT Press, so it's a standalone book. It's an edited collection consisting of like fifteen different chapters, different arguments on for and against robot mm -hmm. sex. So, I mean, it's not all written by me. I just hasten to add to that. Um, Although I do have a, a hand in, I think, three out of the 15 chapters. Okay. All right. So what are the, some of the more interesting claims um, that, you, that you're that you either um, arguing for or against in this book? Well, we, yeah, we, so, we discussed a couple. One of them was like, uh, is it possible for people to have sex with a robot? I mean, there's been tools or toys that have been around. Women have used toys for quite some time, um, but is it possible to legally, I mean, is there a legal definition for this sort of thing? I don't know, but is it possible? Yeah, like, I mean, th that is an interesting question. I guess it's kind of a classical philosophical question, but you know, what does it mean to have sex with somebody or something? Um, I mean, the common criticism or critique of, of robot sex is that it's really just an elaborate form of, of masturbation. Um, just, you know, you wouldn't say that somebody is having sex with a sex toy or with a masturbatory aid of some kind. Um, mm. So what's to say that a sex robot is different because it's just effectively a, a slightly more elaborate sex toy with extra bits added on, you know? Um, so, and, and like, it's an important social question or ethical question as well to some extent because people attach a lot of importance to being able to say that they've had sex with somebody or that they've had sex for the first time. You know, in some cultures, for better or worse, uh, virginity is very closely policed and maintained and people try to toe the line between uh, virginity and um, sexual maturity. 
So it would be important to them to determine whether they've had sex with something. So can you have sex with a robot? Like part of me thinks that this isn't, this is a question that we should avoid uh, in many cases, but um, one argument that you can make is that you can't have sex with a robot because a robot isn't capable of reciprocating or engaging in a, an act of mutual intentionality with you. So to have sex with somebody is to engage in a, uh, a mutual act with them that you both coordinate and agree upon some aim and you're working together to achieve that aim. This is what differentiates, let's say, sexual assault from consensual sex. And so one of the chapters within the book goes into that line of thinking in some detail and makes the case that, that you can't actually have sex with a robot. Okay. What, what if the robot was um, extremely, I guess, like in far future, extremely elaborate, um, for all intents, it had all the, the functional properties of what we experience as raw feels. It had a sense of self. It had a sense of self-determination. Um, would then it be, uh, you know, considered um, a robot? I don't know. If, like if, 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 it, if the robot was considered alive, um, in some sense, uh, although not being biological, would it, would it then be possible? Yeah, so I, I mean, my view would be that if you accept that notion that to have sex with somebody involves engaging in this act of, kind of mutual intentionality, a sufficiently sophisticated robot would be able to engage in an act of mutual intentionality. Now, that, like, that gets into questions about whether robots can have mental lives, mental states, whether they can satisfy the conditions of personhood. I happen to be of the view that a sufficiently sophisticated robot could satisfy all those conditions of personhood. There are people who disagree with that, people who are you know, deeply skeptical of um, AI and, and the possibility of replicating human intelligence or human mentality in an artificial form. I'm not one of them, so I think that uh, it would be possible in that case to, to have sex with a robot. Right. So, but I mean, that, that for all intents and purposes, we can consider that not in the near term. Um, in the near yeah. term, uh, if there are robots, like, you know, some of, uh, some maybe, you know, something like the Japanese robots that have, <laughs> that have uh, been uh, more elaborate sex toys, I've been on the, the news. Um, yeah, they, they could be considered as robots, but they certainly don't have any form of intentionality there. Yeah, they, they certainly wouldn't have the kind of behavioral repertoire or sophistication that you would usually attach to somebody who satisfies the conditions of personhood. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there, there are a couple of prototype sex robots that are available at the moment, or at least being uh, available to view. You can look these up online if you want. There's a famously the Roxy, which is a sex robot that was launched back in, in 2010 by a guy called Douglas Hines. And then more recently, Matt McCullen, who's the founder of a company called Abyss Creations, which makes the real doll. He's uh, created this prototype sex robot called Harmony, which uses a cloud-based AI system and some animatronics in the face to engage in you know, minimal forms of conversation and dialogue with the user. And there, there are a couple of other companies or startups around the world that are trying to create uh, these devices. There's a guy in Barcelona who uh, attracted a lot of notoriety quite recently for s claiming that he was going to have a child with his sex robot. Right. Uh, a three a three D printed child, I think, was a the three D printed child. Wow, that's that's really getting uncanny. So, well, I mean, what can robots um, do for people? Why would people want these? Um, could it improve the quality of people's um, sex lives at all, um, you know, for instance, in, in situations where they wouldn't be, would find it difficult to find a partner um, to, you know, perform, to have sex with, you know, would, would these dolls? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So like, is there a positive case to be made on, on behalf yeah. of the creation and distribution of sex robots? So like one of the chapters in the book goes into that in some detail. Um, I think the chapter is just titled The Case for Sex Robots. And, uh, you know, you can make four main arguments on behalf of sex robots. One, you can just make a very kind of permissive libertarian style argument. You can say that um, if, if the person using the robot is not doing harm to anybody and the robot isn't a moral subject that's capable of being harmed by the action, then 
let's just let bygones be bygones and let people use these devices if they wish. That's not a very strong argument in favor of it. It's just a, an argument for the permission of this technology. Um, a more a kind of stronger positive argument would be something like a hedonistic argument if you think that subjective pleasure is ultimately the fount of all value in the world and you can derive uh, hedonistic pleasure from an interaction with a sex robot, then it's a good thing to allow people to have some kind of sexual satisfaction with a robot uh, because it increases the amount of hedonistic pleasure in the world. Um, another argument to be more complicated would, would be along the lines of what you just outlined there, would be a distributive argument on behalf of sex robots. So there is a growing movement um, that talks about the concept of sex rights, that people have rights to sexual satisfaction and se sexual self-expression. Uh, it's difficult to facilitate those rights in all cases because, again, if, if um, the satisfaction or of sex rights involves two parties, you can't obviously force people to have sex with others unwillingly just to satisfy their sex sexual rights. But maybe robots would be a kind of useful compromise for that. So for people who are, for some reason, denied or unable to gain access to the human sex uh, marketplace of sexual partners, just to use that kind of economic um, analogy or metaphor, uh, the availability or distribution of sex robots to them could be uh, a way of, of satisfying their sex rights. I mean, there are there, so there are people who are shut out or denied access to that marketplace. There are certain contexts in which uh, people live that prevent them from accessing potential sexual partners. Either they live in a very rural or isolated environment, or they live in certain military contexts or prison contexts. It's a more controversial example, um, where they're denied access to sexual partners. Uh, another controversial argument has to do with the rights of persons with disabilities, severe mental or physical disabilities, uh, how they can satisfy their rights to sexual self-expression. Self uh, maybe the distribution of robots to them would be a way of doing this. That, you know, there's an entire chapter within the book dedicated that, to that kind of argument. Um, so that's the, these are the distributive style of arguments. And then there's a final class of arguments that you can make on behalf of sex robots, which has to do with the notion that they would improve human relationships. So myself and Neil MacArthur, who's the, the co-editor on the book, we recently wrote a short op-ed in The Guardian, which summarizes this line of, of thinking, this line of argument. Um, and the basic idea is that a lot of relationships fail or run into trouble for sexual reasons, to reasons that have to do with desire discrepancy between the partners. One person wants more sex than the other person is willing to provide um, the need, for, the lack of sexual variety within a relationship uh, is another reason for re relationships to fail or break down. And maybe the availability of sex robots would be ways to correct for this desire discrepancy and um, facilitate the need for sexual variety in a manner that is less harmful or less damaging to the relationship than the other currently available means of doing that, which is to engage in some affair or to experiment with some form of non-monogamy. Mm. Um, so those are kind of four arguments you can make on behalf of sex robots and the kind of positive consequences that they could have for uh, human sexual experiences and for relationships as well. Interestingly, there's a couple of people in the chat room and one of them brought up that it, it could um, uh, potentially uh, improve chances of getting a real partner by using the sex robot to get into better habits. And I followed up that, you know, it may sound like a joke, but it could be a serious um, sex education tool. Yeah, um, so you could, you could imagine it being used as a sex educational tool. I mean, the medical department in my university uses robots and virtual reality to test out um, surgical techniques and different medical techniques all the time. So it's not completely far-fetched to imagine that the, the sex education classes of the future will use maybe a combination of, of robots and virtual reality uh, mm. interactive um, programs. Mm. Uh, I mean, there's another maybe more maybe, maybe serious... Maybe autistic, autistic people or, or people who 
have some sort of uh, dysfunction and don't know how naturally it doesn't it's not something that comes natural to them um or yeah. they had a, a traumatic experience and, and they you know were, wanted to not ever touch another human being ever again and would slowly um therapeutically be introduced to the idea through robots not having emotions not having to deal with um the complexity of the notion uh emotions in another human being that they could get you know use robots as a stepping stone for to get to um back to normal yeah so neil MacArthur actually makes this argument and it's i think it's quite interesting because it inverts a usual criticism of sex robots okay so a criticism of sex robots would be that well they'll be passive and submissive and this will encourage people to um, have the wrong kind of sexual script when it comes to their relationships with other human beings. Uh, particularly, let's say, men, if the, most of these robots are going to be designed to look or re represent females initially anyway, seems more than likely given the kind of dynamics of the, the sex doll market. Um, you know, it'll be objectifying to women and it'll encourage men to treat them as these passive sexual subjects. So that's a, that's a common criticism of, of sex robots. So what's interesting is that Neil uh, flips that on its head for, in the case of people who have suffered from some kind of sexual trauma. You know, what they might need is a passive um, sexual partner, somebody that they don't feel threatened by, that they um, feel safe with. And again, perhaps a robot is a way for them to feel that safety and security as they try to ease themselves back into healthy sexual relationships with mm. other human beings, perhaps, yeah. So that, that, I mean, they could be a useful stepping stone there as well. Right. Look, I'm, I'm glad you uh, um, wrote this book. because It is a subject that people have um, used as fodder for quite a lot of humour, um, but it also could be a subject that could be taken seriously and could improve people's lives if we gave it the time of day to think about it, you know, uh, squarely, in a sense. Um, someone in a chat room brought up that uh, it would be difficult to get these robots out of the uncanny valley. Um, but I was also thinking conversely that these robots may not have to look exactly like people. They may intentionally look cartoonish or um, sort of hyper realistic in some ways and like more like Barbie dollish in a sense rather than trying to look like real women. Yeah, um, so I mean, the what they are representing and how they look that is to some extent contingent and up for grabs. Um, the assumption in a lot of the conversation is that they will attempt to replicate human beings uh, more mm. or less realistically. I mean, just on, on the Uncanny Valley idea, you know, um, that was, like originally when that was presented by what was his name, Masahiro Mori, back in the 70s, that was just a hypothesis or suggestion that there would be this uncanny valley as, as a robot or a virtual representation of a human being became more human-like. It would reach this point where it would be creepy and people would be freaked out by it. Um, and there, you know, there's some anecdotal support for that idea uh, in films. So I think I use the example of the Polar Express film by Robert Zemeckis back in 2004. A lot of people found that really unsettling because the characters were too human-like within it. But it's only really in the past sort of decade and a half that people have tried, started to investigate the Uncanny Valley empirically to figure out does it really exist and um, what causes it, what prompts it. And if you look at that literature, there's some people are quite skeptical of the idea that there is this Uncanny Valley. So actually one of the chapters in the book by Julie Carpenter goes into some of the reasons to be skeptical of it that she she argues that the acceptability of robots depends not just on kind of immediate psychological reactions to the robots but on broader cultural and social forces and that if we normalize the presence of social robots in our lives we will find them much less creepy and unsettling uh, she so she develops like a counter hypothesis to the uncanny valley which she calls the robot accommodation process theory. So the idea is that over time we become more accommodating of robots when they're normalized within fiction, within society, um, within education and so forth. So that we just become much more socially accepting of them. And even people who look at the psychological underpinnings of the 
Uncanny Valley will claim that there are ways in which you can stop it from being so severe or um, unsettling to people. And, you know, there's, and there's also a lot of dispute about what the real mechanism behind it is mm. as well. Mm. So yeah, it, it, it's interesting. Um, another person brought up that uh, these these dolls, these robots, could uh, look like uh, cartoon or well, anime cartoons, which aren't quite human. Like they have massive eyes and tiny little nose and huge heads, often compared to the size of their bodies. Um, I'm not sure if that'll happen, but I, I'd say for therapeutic uses, that probably wouldn't necessarily be the case. But it might be for, I guess, conventional sort of um, people just wanting, yeah, you know, just to get pleasure out of these sorts of things. Maybe they could uh, sort of fashion these dolls into their favourite cartoon characters. Who knows? But, um, well, I, I mean, so there's, there is an interesting point here to be made about if you look at the market for sex toys more generally. Um, there are some countries in the world that ban human-like sex toys, that the, right. uh, sex toys that represent human-like body parts. I think actually Japan might be a country where there's a prohibition on this. So oftentimes sex toys are marketed to be shaped like animals or in other... Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It's kind of weird when you think of it like that. Like there's vibrators that look like dolphins or cute little animals, for instance. But um, when you think about it, you know, if you, if you make a sex toy that's meant to be sort of semi-life-sized um, and life-like, it kind of would be really strange to, like, sell a sex toy that looked like a like an animal, like a, a sheep or something. It would be, like, really sort of disturbing. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, but, but it's a way people, that... But should it be illegal? I don't know. Well, I mean, so there's a question of should it be illegal, but I think the other point is that... Um... Sometimes countries go about like banning yeah, certain yeah, representations, yeah, that's right. and a way that manufacturers then circumvent those bans is to create sex toys that have other forms of representation. I think you could imagine something similar happening when it comes mm. to sex robots. Right, and then you know um, it could we, it could be a, a real nasty ethical dilemma if people start making them to look like children, for instance. Well, um, I mean. Yeah, yeah, although already there's happened. no children getting harmed, it's the image um, of a child which is being sort of um, violated in a sense. Now, I don't, I don't know what the the ethical norms are for that in um, in, in 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 legal terms. But if there are cartoons of children, a child porn or something like that, it's, I, I, I assume that that would be illegal. Yeah, so I mean, this is an interesting question because it's actually already happening to some extent. That uh, there was a guy in the UK who was prosecuted for attempting to import a child sex doll earlier this summer. So there's mm -hmm. a particular law against the importation of obscene objects that he uh, ran foul of. But there, a lot of uh, European countries ban wholly virtual child pornography. So child pornography that involves virtual representations that are made to look like children engaging in sexual acts. So there's no mm -hmm. real children harmed in the making of these images and yet they're still outlawed um, largely on the grounds of either extreme offensiveness so there's a, a legal statute in England which bans uh, extreme pornography and mm -hmm. child pornography is included within that, that bracket of extreme pornography and again irrespective of whether people were harmed in the making of it or if people are harmed by the consequences of it mm -hmm. and there are also then other countries that uh, ban this. One of the stated rationales for it is because it encourages or promotes child pornography or child, child pedophilia. So there are concerns about that. So I mean, that's definitely one of the more contentious aspects of this. And the, the, this is kind of the darker side of the debate mm -hmm. about robot sex is mm -hmm. that people will use sex robots to engage in forms of sexual activity that are either extremely offensive and improper or uh, deemed to be deviant in some way. Mm -hmm. But there's more of the milder, um, and perhaps, you know, uh, I'd say there wouldn't be any issue of people having sex dolls that are just normal representations of other adults like themselves. Um, but people will campaign against that uh, that idea, won't they? Um, but, uh, yeah, I yes. mean, there, there already is a campaign against sex robots. Right, yes. 
Okay. Do you want to describe that and and uh, how, and and what their what the issues are with the campaign and uh, yeah, what they so, see I mean, as the ethical dilemmas and what and why they're right or wrong? Yeah. So the, there's a campaign against sex robots, which was started in 2015 by two people, Kathleen Richardson, who's a senior research fellow at the De Montfort University in Leicester, and uh, a guy called Eric Skovda, who I can't remember where he's from, but he seems to be a less prominent part of the campaign. It, it seems to be largely Kathleen Richardson, and she's the real public face of it. So, you know, the reasons that they campaign against them are, I guess, in some ways, uh, replicating classic kind of anti-porn feminist arguments. So, you know, within the feminist community, there's always been an, a prominent and vocal strain of thought that is opposed to things like uh, pornography and sex work. Um, and just to say here, you know, I think it's important to point out that feminism isn't like a single church with uh, uh, an agreed upon doctrine. There are multiple different view points of view and you can find sex positive feminists and feminists who are in favor of the liberalization or decriminalization of sex work. But there is nevertheless this kind of prominent anti-porn and anti-sex work strand of thought within feminism. And the campaign against sex robots is uh, kind of largely playing on those kinds of arguments that have long existed in that, that anti-porn community. So, I mean, the concerns that they have about sex robots is that irrespective of um, whether they are designed to represent or replicate a deviant or problematic uh, sexual acts, it's just the, the, the mere fact that you're representing women in this form where they are uh, always willing, agreeable sexual partners is socially problematic. Uh, it encourages the users of the sex robots to depersonalize the other, the other part, the other actor in the sexual act. Um, encourages them to objectify them. This will carry over into how the users of sex robots relate to other human beings. So they will treat them in a subordinating, submissive manner. So it'll perpetuate problems with you know, patriarchal domination of society. Um, so like it's a fairly strong uh, anti-porn, anti-sex uh, work feminist argument. And in fact, within the literature of the campaign against sex robots, they draw explicit analogies between the use of sex robots and sex work. So they think that the main problem with the creation of sex robots is, is that it's trying to replicate uh, the interaction between a sex worker and a client. Uh, you know, there is a little bit of truth to that insofar as David Levy, who is one of the most prominent voices in the world of, of sex robots, he wrote this book back in 2007 called Love and Sex with Robots, which was really the first, I guess, um, a mainstream book that talked about this topic at, at great length. It was based on his PhD thesis, and he's a, a creator of this technology. Uh, within his chapter on the design, or one of his chapters on the design of sex robots, he does draw explicit analogies between commercial sex and sex work and the creation of, of, of sex robots. So it does suggest that there's this attempt to create a facsimile of the interaction that one might get between a sex uh, worker and a client in the robotic or artificial form. And that's the concern that underlies the, the campaign against sex robots. Right. I mean, like, but to, was there ever an issue that feminists or um, other parties might have had to to earlier forms of robotics, like vibrators, um, or you know, dildos it, that that sort of had some mechanical function, could be considered robotic, um, or that you know, at least you know, little blow up dolls. They're not robotic. They're just toys. But so are vibrators. Um, where did the argument sort of fall over in um, with regard to these sorts of devices, just dildos and vibrators? Yeah, so uh, th Why this, this is a good question. Yeah. This is a good question, and I I don't actually know the history of the debate on sex toys specifically. I know it r pretty well on pornography and sex work, but I don't know it on on sex toys per se. I mean, there is some uh, early opposition to sex toys insofar as you know the original vibrators were created as tools for curing what was called hysteria, which is largely viewed as a kind of a made up. Um, socially constructed illness, but women having these kind of um, unquenchable sexual desires that needed to be satisfied and they weren't being satisfied by their, their husbands. So the, the use of these vibrators was a way of curing them of that uh, hysteria. 
And so it's a way of policing and managing the female body and female sexuality. So there, there was opposition to, or some opposition to the creation of, of vibrators and sex toys initially. And there, there has been opposition to the notion of sex dolls historically yeah. as well. Right. Um, there are people who've written, let's say, about Real Doll, for example, which sure. is the most famous company in this space that creates these very hyper-realistic dolls. Um, you know, the kind of representation that they put into their dolls tends to be like the, the porn star look. In fact, Real Doll have contracts with uh, porn uh, film companies where they recreate some of their stars in, in doll-like form. Um, mm. uh, like, uh, if you talk to Matt McCullen or if you listen to him being interviewed, I've never spoken to him, but I've heard him being interviewed, um, you know, he will say that he'll make dolls that cater to pretty much anyone's preferences and uh, preferred shape or form. Uh, so he makes kind of bespoke dolls. The majority tend to prefer this porn star look, but mm -hmm. um, there are a handful of people who prefer uh, kind of not unconventional looks as well in, in this form. Um, so yeah, like I, I, I don't know of much writing that is currently opposed to sex toys for women. I, I don't know if I've really come across anything of that sort, but mm -hmm. I have come across stuff that is opposed to, to sex dolls. Mm -hmm. I imagine there's been instances where um, men have complained that once their wives have sort of discovered vibrators, they don't have a sex life anymore. But they've <laughs> they've been um, <laughs> ob um, made obsolete in the sense, um, and maybe they feel that, in some sense, women get just what they need from uh, you know toys and vibrators. Uh, and therefore don't need to date men anymore um, unless they, you know, want to have some sort of emotional bonding with a man. But, it, you know, it's just a, another aspect of of a, of a relationship which has been sort of automated. Um, and so, you know, imagine we did reach a sort of, one of the people in the chat room brought up Westworld. Imagine we, we uh, reach Westworld-like uh, sort of, dolls that were convincing enough that they were, you know, better substitutes than, than real women because there was, didn't have to be any emotional um, uh, commitment there and they could do exactly what they want. What sociological uh, issues would that have um, if people didn't feel the need to bond with each other as much anymore because of automated ways to um, fulfill this sort of aspect of Maslow's hierarchy. Yeah, so I think that probably goes into the maybe two issues, like what, what happens when you have hyper-realistic sex robots that are in some way indistinguishable from human beings and possibly quote-unquote better sexual partners than, than human beings? Um, what are the ethical and sociological consequences of that? And then the other question is like what, um, what makes for a valuable and worthwhile intimate relationship or mm. sexual relationship with somebody. So I, you know, I think a lot of people would say on the, the question of what makes for a valuable intimate relationship that there's a lot of skepticism around whether um, sex robots could ever fulfill the criteria that we need within a, a truly valuable intimate relationship. So the, the, the idea is that you know a normative desirable intimate relationship involves some element of mutuality and reciprocity and mm. The concern about a relationship with a robot would be that it's very asymmetrical and uh, involves this kind of power dynamic where you have the owner and user of the robot and the robot themselves, and they're not necessarily treated as an equal. Um, and there are actually two chapters within the book that kind of go into this in some detail. It's probably worth talking about some of the arguments that they uh -huh. raise. So I'll just mention one of the chapters. is It's a, by Sven Nyholm and Lily Frank. Um, so they talk about, is it possible to love a robot, to fall in love with a robot? And they go through a lot of the leading theories of what it means to have a loving relationship with somebody. And I'll just mention three of them. So there's one theory that in order to have a loving relationship with somebody um, to it, that is mutually, or sorry, that is fulfilling from your perspective, it's, it's enough if they kind of, if the other person goes through the motions that they behave as though they are in this loving relationship with you. Um, and, but they're quite dismissive of that argument because they think that 
well, if, if it was true that all that matters for a good quality intimate relationship was that the other person behaves as if they love you mm. and that's as if they care about you, then you could hire a, a, an actor to be your partner. Well, people that do. Wouldn't really, well, people do, yes. Well, that's what, in some, to some extent, that's what some sex workers do. They provide a facsimile of uh, a real intimate partner, the, you know, the, the girlfriend experience as it's referred to within the industry. Um, so that, that's a kind of a behavioristic approach to what makes for a valuable, loving relationship. Um, and th this is effectively all that a robot would ever be doing. That's one of their claims, that it would just be going through the motions, pretending as if it, um, as if it loves you, but it doesn't have the, the corresponding inner mental states. Now that gets us back to the debate about whether robots can have these, this inner mental life or inner mental states. But that's the suspicion about robots is that they would just be behavioristically in love with you, not truly in love with you. Um, there are other theories then that they talk about, like uh, the good match theory is that in order to have a, a valuable relationship with somebody, you have to be a good match for them. You have to have a complementary set of values and interests and views on life. And you know, some people are more kind of bullish or optimistic on the prospects of robots being designed to be a good match for you. Because you can, again, you can customize them to perfectly fit and match with your profile. Uh, you know, this is what a lot of internet dating companies claim to offer is that they have these algorithms for matching you with somebody who perfectly complements your set of values. That, that depends upon the pool of human beings out there consisting of people with that profile match. Well, why, why not kind of obviate the need for that by creating robots that are custom made to match your, your profile, your set of interests. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it seems like you, you probably could do that. Um, so one concern, however, that Nihon and Frank have about that argument is that it means that the robot is made for you. It's designed to match your preferences, but you're not made for each other. So that, again, there's no true kind of mutuality or intimacy involved in that. Uh, style of relationship. It does still seem to be one way. Um, another I, concern then that features a lot in this debate, this is one other argument that I'll mention, is uh, in, order for it, in order to be in a valuable, loving relationship with somebody, they, they have to freely and willingly enter into that relationship. Again, it, it's not good enough for them to be forced into the relationship with you. you know, again, if you found out that your intimate partner had been threatened by somebody to form this relationship with you and if they didn't, some member of their family would be hurt or injured. And it, you, know, you, you lived a seemingly happy relationship with them for a period of time and then you found this out, that would presumably lead the whole thing to crumble, the whole facade to fall down. Uh, and and the, the concern with robots is that they wouldn't have free will and be able to freely and willingly enter into a relationship with you. So again, it wouldn't kind of match the criteria for a valuable intimate relationship. So even if you had a hyper-realistic robot of kind of Westworld's equivalent uh, sophistication, some people would argue that you still couldn't have a truly valuable intimate relationship with them because it wouldn't meet these criteria for true kind of mutuality and free consensual giving of, of love to another person. Now, I have to say that I am somewhat skeptical of those arguments um, insofar as I'm, I'm somewhat of a, a behaviorist when it comes to the ethics of our relationships with other people. I outlined this in another interview I did recently in some detail, and I'm trying to write a, a post about it. But like in essence, I think that when it comes to establishing what justifies or grounds our belief in the value of any interaction we have with another person, all we ever have to go on are their kind of outward behavioral states. So it's the case that a robot is indistinguishable from an ordinary human being. I think that we could have just as valuable a relationship with a robot as we would with any ordinary human being, insofar as the, the epistemic justification for our belief in the value of that relationship would be the exact same in both instances. Mm -hmm. Except, um, with the sophisticated technology that we do have, or perhaps will have in the future, we might be able to get inklings into their in internal state by um, reading uh, or, or registering what's going on inside their logic or their brains, so to speak. Um, yeah, but again, we, we could do the same with human beings, presumably, but you could put yeah, your partner right. in a, an MRI scanner and mm -hmm. see what's going on in their heads. Mm -hmm. So again, 
it would probably it would you would have some functional equivalent to that within the robot. Mm -hmm. and again, it would be indistinguishable in that sense. So mm -hmm. I, I think this the same principle of what I call ethical behaviorism applies. And, well, and you know, this this is one reason why I don't like this claim about the, the problem with the behavioristic approach to int the value of intimate relationships is that. Well, imagine if you hired an actor to be your partner and they went through the motions, um, that wouldn't be a valuable relationship. I think that's a, a misleading analogy because th the problem with the case of the actor is that you find out that they've been hired to be your partner or you know that they've been hired to be your partner. Um, and, and stop, and stop uh, you know, um, acting intimate with you when you, don't, when you don't pay them or something. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, but if it's the case that the robot is always consistently representing themselves as... Uh, their as your intimate partner, it, it, and it doesn't depend on on payment for them, or there's no you have no reason to doubt the genuineness of their commitment to you based on their outward behavior. Um, again, I think it would be equivalent. So I don't know if it's an exact analogy. I'll just use a, a an example from kind of films recently or movie depictions of of relationships yeah, with robots. Yeah, I was going to bring up her, right? <laughs> Well, I was going to bring up her. I was going to bring up um, Blade Runner twenty forty nine. So, okay. have you yeah. seen it, this? I have, and yeah. I hope everybody has too, because it's a great film. Um, and is there any serious spoilers? <laughs> if there are, close your ears, everybody. Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to spoil warning. it. But, <laughs> but there is um there is a depiction of like an intimate relationship with a virtual reality being. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Like a like a hologram. Yeah. Um, and I think I think the way in which it's depicted in the the movie is interesting in that like you know I I, I felt genuinely emotionally upset um, mm -hmm. about that relationship or emotionally moved by that relationship when I saw it. Yeah, uh, I yeah. I won't spoil it in terms of what happens in the, yeah. to the relationship yeah. Yeah. to the relationship. Yeah. 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 Um, even though it's the case that this is clearly a commercially marketed product in the world of the film, mm. um, the fact is that okay, this person bought this product, but it's still behaves consistently in a way that suggests that they are in a genuinely intimate, mutual relationship. Mm. And I, I think that that would be sufficient for a valuable relationship. Mm. That, that kind of places me on the extreme of views when it comes to our, our, the ethics of our relationships with robots, but that's uh, a position that I've been more and more inclined to over time. Right. So if, if, if the inner workings of the robot are functionally equivalent to what a human would um, be uh, when it is, um, you know, uh, in, in love with another human being, then for all intents and purposes, would you consider the robot to be in love with their, the person who, um, if the robot with, I won't say owned, but yeah, the robot was with. Yeah, uh, so this is where it gets tricky. In that, um, I think that if if the robot was behavioristically equivalent, including equivalent within their internal, their functionally equivalent internal yeah. workings, it wouldn't have to be atom by atom or molecule by mo molecule, but at some meaningful functional level. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it, it's it's basically just like an ethical Turing test. Is what I'm imagining here. Is that there's the um, all the grounds you have for thinking that a human being is in love with you, you have the same grounds for thinking that the robot is in love with you. Um, the, da the danger in that scenario then is that, well, if it's the case that robots are behavioristically equivalent to human beings, that means we probably would owe them the same kind of level of, of respect and rights and we'd have the same duties towards them as we would have towards any other human being. Uh, so that, that's where... Um, not only is there the possibility of a more valuable intimate relationship with them, there's also the fact that we have to treat them in a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, can't, we can no longer do with them as we please or do with them uh, any violent or dangerous things that we might do to a human being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good point. Um, so, I had a question before. Yeah, well, what do you think about the, the Her film and, and that representation? You see the, the character there um, develops, gets so intelligent and develops a sense of being and, and, and uh, a sense of love and a sense of um, feeling and desire, uh, um, maybe volition. And then, you know, um, basically disappears because 
humans get boring. <laughs> oh, sorry, I've just spoiled her. I'm pretty sure everybody watching this would have seen it by now. Uh, but yeah, do you think that, that that might be an issue in the future with uh, these robots? They'll, they'll leave us. <laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 I guess that kind of, I mean, the debate there is really equivalent to the debates about what you think super intelligent or super uh, super powerful or uh, super capacity um, artificial beings will do to human beings, how they will relate to human beings. I mean, like the thing that interests me a lot about her from, a, from the perspective of this debate has to do with the unembodied nature of the, the relationship. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a purely, to, to a larger extent, it's a purely intellectualized relationship. There is, again, spoiler alert, a scene within the film where they try to um, act out a kind of sexual interaction through a sexual surrogate. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you similar remember to that, but Blade similar to Blade Runner 2049. Another spoiler. Although I mean, I I I liked both of those scenes because they have slightly different ways of depicting it. Mm. But oh, I, yeah. I particularly liked the Blade Runner 2049 scene. I did. I, I'm wondering if there will be an extended cut of that scene in the DVD release sometime. Well, I saw something. I saw something recently that the actual film was. There was a suspicion that originally it was going to be two two-hour films. I don't know if you saw that. Oh yeah. really? Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty long film as as it stands. I liked it. I was not bored. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't bored either. Um, although you know, some people haven't haven't liked it for some reasons. But anyway, I, my point about the the her is that it, it's an unembodied relationship to a large extent. So it, it's um. It's interesting that it's it's a it's effectively an intellectual relationship that they have or um, conversational relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, the depiction of it is that you know somebody could form a very tight emotional bond with an operating system AI, I think, is absolutely realistic, and there are already people who are probably doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's quite an interesting book written by a, a New York Times journalist called "To Siri with Love." Which was about the relationship between her autistic son and the Siri operating system, hmm. um, which I thought was quite touching in many ways. But how, like, what was what was interesting about it was that, as the mother of an autistic son, son, she was saying how you know sometimes, even though she probably shouldn't admit this, she can grow frustrated with her son and the way in which he has this kind of single track mind and constantly asks the same questions over and over again about the weather. This was the illustration in, in the book. But Siri is just endlessly patient with her son, will always answer the questions or queries that he asks. So there's actually a value to the relationship with the operating system. It complements and enhances the relationship with the human mother. So she, mm. she, view, she views Siri as a, a kind of valuable third partner in that relationship, which mm. I found quite interesting. And again, I think that's a useful way maybe of thinking about the future of intimate relationships with technology. Yeah, I mean, like, we need to sort of experiment with these sorts of things um, first before we really know uh, what sort of effect they might have. And so experimenting, using, like, observing the way that people interact with virtual assistants um, and interact, you know, with toys or, or you know, um, with robots, you know, not just sexually, but, you know, intimately in general, um, is, is, is useful. What kinds of... Uh, well, okay, so it seems there is a need, um, as you've outlined in your book, to treat these things as an experiment. What kinds of experiments then do you think will be the most useful in trying to garner or predict how these sorts of technologies might play out in larger applications in the real world? Yeah, and so th like, this is one of the main arguments that I, I make within the book is that it's not original to me either. Is but is that like technology should be treated as a so more as a, as an actual ongoing social experiment, as opposed to the current approach that we have towards technology, which is that it's effectively a commercial product, and the companies companies can release any product that they like into the world um, as long as it meets certain basic health and safety protocols. Mm. Mm. And like that has always struck me as an odd thing, and because if you think about it, you know. The iPhone or smartphone has had a dramatic effect on human society and human life, and yet we human never behavior. we never carried out like kind of systematic trials or, pro or of the impact of iPhones in the same way that we would like for a medical drug. We would 
we would look at we'd have you know careful trials of, of how this technology uh, or this drug works on humans and we'd monitor it over a period of years and we'd release it in kind of staggered stages initially mm -hmm. and experiment in different ways it always strikes me as odd that we don't do something similar with technology now i know that there are a lot of people within let's say transhumanist communities that are much more in favor of kind of experimenting with technology in a I don't want to say reckless, but a more open fashion that they don't like lots of regulation and restrictions on technology. Cavalier fashion. <laughs> Ca yeah, cavalier fashion. We're uh, a, a pro-cautionary attitude towards technology. Um, pro-actionary. So, pro-actionary, sorry. Yeah, as a, yeah pro-actionary as opposed to precautionary uh, approach yeah. to technology. So I, like, I'm not necessarily advocating a precautionary approach to technology either, but I think that uh, because of the dramatic kind of social consequences of technology, I think we should uh, try to have more kind of systematic experiments with the development and use of technology and try to, to manage the way in which it's unrolled across society more carefully, rather than just unleashing it and seeing what happens based on the, you know, the commercial viability of the product or whatever. Well, that's yeah. right. I mean, like when you think of Facebook, I mean, on, on the face of things, um, Zuckerberg and others claim that it's connecting people and it's doing an enormous good, but it, it didn't seem as though it was built from the ground up to make people's life better, um, more than it was designed to keep people's attention and get their eyes on advertisement. Um, yeah. And, you know, like, and, and so it, it plays into um, how people also uh, get sucked into filter bubbles and uh, I guess more sort of unaware of other people's ways of thinking around them. And, and so there's a, an interesting uh, discussion going on at the moment as the role of Cambridge Analytica in sort of nudging people's behaviour um, in times of, you know, political, when people are meant to vote and, and, and had some rather interesting political and so, yes, I mean, that's a whole separate discussion, I guess, but like it, yeah, we, it doesn't seem as though all of the technology is really been, um, built to benefit uh, the, the average person. It's more like just a way to extract money and, and, and manipulate people. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I a bit. So, but again, it's, it's not directly related to, I think it, these debates are related to this, this current conversation because if, have we lear, if we've learned anything from and these past experiences with mass technologies is that they can have lots of these undesirable or unintended consequences because they are designed and produced to make them commercially viable. And that means that they do certain things like try to distract you and capture your attention so that they can push advertising towards you that are probably not as wonderfully socially beneficial as the purveyors of these technologies would claim. Mm -hmm. um, so we shouldn't take Facebook's word for it that they are creating a wonderful global village in which people can uh, interact with old high school friends and you know engage in a much more mutually satisfying ongoing set of, of social relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, we, sh we should be suspicious of those kinds of claims. And for the same reasons, I think we should be a little bit worried if something like a sex robot or the sex robot market or more generally the, in, the, ro the, ro the market for intimate robots is dominated by commercial interests. So mm -hmm. This is why I think we should take this more experimental approach to it so where we can test out different potential uses of it that might be more or less valuable to society. Right. You know? So again, there, there are multiple uh, kinds of trials that you could imagine taking place. You know, is this a useful treatment for people who have suffered from sexual trauma or violence? Um, is it potentially useful in the, the treatment of, of pedophilic interests? That's a more controversial claim that um, Ronald Arkin made a few years ago. Um, could it enhance the quality of human relationships in some way? And there are all these things that I think we, we should experiment with, but we should do so in a, a thoughtful and somewhat systematic manner rather than leaving it to the kind of haphazard effects of, of the market. That's one of the main kind of claims that I defend within the book. Mm -hmm. Yes, that was one of the questions I did want to raise, it comes to think of it. <laughs> uh, the flow on effects of having sex robots would be the creators therefore be able to um, 
use them like in in ways uh, that um, would be able to emotionally manipulate the the people who use them. So, like for instance, if people feel strongly and develop an emotional sort of bond to the robot, um, would the robot be able to sort of uh, emotionally manipulate the people who are involved with them if they're sophisticated enough by um, withholding, you know, certain aspects of sex with them or, or some sort of intimacy bonding or, you know, being a bit sort of stubborn or um, ignoring the needs of the, 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 the robot owner. I'll just say owner now because I don't know what people call the relationship with this robot. These robots, once they get a whole lot more sophisticated, but yes, yeah, you get where I'm uh, going. You, you, you understand what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so, if you look at what's yeah. happening with, if you look at what's happening in the world of social robots generally, you know, they they aren't going to, to be self-contained units. Um, you could imagine a world in which people are building these robots themselves in their basements and they're mm. designing them and programming them and tricking them out for themselves and for their own uses. Um, but that's not the world that we're inhabiting harmony the the sex robot that's created by real doll they it's based on cl cloud ai okay so it's it, the the ai program isn't directly situated in the physical embodied object it's uh, on some server somewhere and it's being uh, beamed into the robot um mm. and so you could definitely imagine people using that kind of platform to mm. manipulate people in certain ways maybe Maybe it'll start innocently enough by just you know, pushing advertising to them, or the maker of Real Doll will say, "Well, we can encourage them to buy other other forms of our products." So maybe the, the sex robot suggests during a sexual encounter, "Well, you should also maybe consider purchasing this product, and it'll be even better." Or there, maybe there's some in in app purchases or something when you download like part of the AI, and but if you want to upgrade to the next level, you're, you have to buy something else. That 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 is more than likely going to happen in these uh, for the technology and then the more sinister and manipulative part of this is that people could use the same thing to affect people the quality of people's intimate lives in the same way that Facebook engaged in this kind of mass contagion experiment uh, trying to manipulate moods if the distribution of sex robots is sufficiently wide similar experiments could be performed through kind of different a b testing on the personalities or of the AI that the, the robot uses so yeah those are things that we we should be concerned about. I, I don't know if the concerns are heightened in the case of robots, um, but they are certainly the same kinds of concerns that we have about other platform network technologies more generally. Mm. Yes, uh, platform, platform network technologies, um, you know, mobile phones, they can be hacked as well. Um, they can be sort of infiltrated. And it could be dangerous if these sorts of tools were hacked or, or um, sort of, yeah, it, especially if people find themselves in very compromising positions with these, these robots. So that's an issue. But before, like, I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on whether these robots could be used much like social media, but maybe even on a more deep sort of level because of the the you know sex being like such a a strong um a, a strong instinct that, that that we've had for hundreds of thousands of years and our ancestors have had for millions of years whether there be a sort of real deep um sort of uh, hijacking of of our award systems of our, our of our instincts in order to manipulate us to do things we would that social media in general wouldn't be able to do on its own. Yeah, well, I mean, this all obviously just all reminds me of the um, the classic Futurama episode about uh -huh. uh, the, the the Lucy Liu robot. Right. Um, I don't know if you've seen that, but yeah, yeah. this whole this whole fake per public service announcement in the middle of that about why you shouldn't date robots because once you have um, basically a sexual interaction on tap or on demand whenever you want it and it's the equivalent of what you'd get with a human being you'll never want to leave the house again you'll never want to do anything it'll just be completely captivating and absorbing mm -hmm. and if you think about a lot of the concerns with social media technology nowadays is that they are distracting and 
uh, grabbing our attention in ways that are counterproductive. Um, you know, these books by Tim Wu and Adam Alter, it's all about the addictive attention sapping power of uh, digital media. Um, if the kind of quality of the experience and the captivating nature of the experience with the robot is even higher, it is a concern that you could have that they could be used for uh, more forms of manipulation because they are so engaging. Um, I mean, you know, the, the Futurama fear about this leading to the collapse of civilization seems a little bit far-fetched to me insofar as the desire for intimate sexual contact is, I think, only one among many motivations that human beings have. Um, but, you know, I, I can still imagine the technology being used to that effect and having these negative effects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to have to go in a couple of minutes. So. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sure, that's fine. Yeah, you've got, you've got things to do. So, um, on the, as a final point, uh, you, you, you do bring up in the book that you don't think um, loving relationships uh, with robots are likely, at least in the near term. Is that is that correct? Or, well, I mean, that, that, um, whether they could be a good thing. Well, that kind of goes back to the argument I was looking at earlier on about, you know, What's the value of an intimate relationship, and uh, could robots be behavioristically equivalent to uh, human beings in in the intimate context? Um, so I think a lot of people are skeptical of the idea that you could have valuable intimate relationships with with robots. Uh, mm -hmm. Then the, the chapters in the book that have, look into this tend to be skeptical of it. Mm -hmm. um, my own personal view is that. I'm, I'm less skeptical of the possibility of valuable intimate relationships with robots, but I do think it's we're probably a, we're probably a good distance away from having relationships that are equivalent to the ones that we have with human beings. But again, I do think there are lesser uses of robots in re intimate contexts that could complement and enhance uh, human relationships. So again, to go back to the example of uh, I can't remember the name of the journalist, but with her autistic son and the Siri operating system the Siri operating system complements the pre-existing human relationship. Obviously, that's not a sexual relationship, but I think you could imagine something equivalent happening in a sexual relationship where um, having this kind of complementary third party could be of value. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, it's been wonderful having you again on the show. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time and all the prolific sort of study you do and the uh, academic output it's great and also I think that it, it's important to realize that we shouldn't just use the idea of a sex robot as a um, just something to lampoon and, and laugh about it's something that's probably going to come you know within our lifetime and um, it, you know at least advanced forms of it too so yeah uh, it, it's important but also I'd like to thank all the viewers for watching as well um, and yes uh, if you want to know more about these um, or you want to be notified about these videos, please subscribe. But yeah, thanks heaps, John. I appreciate yeah. it. Uh, really, not, really, just... yeah, yeah, you want to group the book or tell them where they can find out more. Well, just two things. I mean, number one, I just want to further kind of promote your work that you do through these uh, video series. I think um, you know, I've listened to many of the conversations that you've had with people multiple times over the years, and um, it's a great resource that you've put together. Uh, and in, then in terms of myself, if I'm shilling for a product, uh, I do. So this book is available. It is an academic book, but I think it's reasonably accessible. At least, you know, a lot of the chapters are reasonably accessible to a general audience. And it is also, unlike many academic books, pretty affordable. So it's like $30 at the moment. So it's like the standard price for a hardback book. Um, but yeah. Yeah, you don't. You, I'm not <laughs> I'm not compelling you to purchase it. I'm not going to make uh, money on this. I, I suspect, but um, you can read also a lot of my material about this topic online for free as well. Mm -hmm. And so, all the links uh, to uh, the books and, and online material will be in the description there. So, yeah. Okay, great. Well, Sorry, I couldn't talk for longer, but well, that was great. No, was, I think we covered got a lot of ground there. So, thanks, Pete. All right. Thanks, Adam. Bye now. Bye. Bye.